Good evening. Welcome to the <coughs> February 13, 2012 uh, meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. I'd like to thank everyone for being here. And uh, please join me for, oh, I'm sorry, can we have the roll call? Chairman Lennon? Here. Councillor Gouvenali? Here. Councillor Jordan? Here. Councillor Ray? Here. Councillor Sherman? Here. Councillor Sullivan? Here. Councillor Walsh? Here. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Town Council reports and correspondence. Yes. I had the opportunity to attend my first Eco Maine board meeting a few weeks ago, and uh, it is just a very impressive facility. Last week, uh, the director of Eco Maine took me on a, a two hour tour, <coughs> and I learned a lot about how that place works. And it was, again, just very impressive. I feel very fortunate that the town a few decades ago joined forces with other, other municipalities to create uh, this facility. Uh, and I urge any citizen, if they have the opportunity, to learn more about it. Anyone else? OK, moving on. Uh, now is the time for uh, opportunity for citizens uh, to have any comments or discussion for items not on tonight's agenda. So if you want to speak to something other than um, the topics of this evening, please feel free to come forward. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the council. My name is Mark Dennison. I was born and raised in Cape Elizabeth, Maine. I am a 1979 graduate of Cape Elizabeth High School. I owned property, property at 64 Spurwick Avenue for 13 years. I later sold it. I am presently living in South Portland, where I reside for 15 years. But I currently hold one-third interest in the property at 63 Spurwick Avenue, Cape Elizabeth, Maine. I come before you tonight with strong concerns for the welfare of our community, policies, and protection of our hardworking employees. I namely am concerned about three incidences which have occurred within the last seven day span involving Public Works Department. Excuse me, let me clarify that a little bit which have occurred within a seven-day span involving Public Works Department. Because of my ob observations and reportings have been disregarded, I contacted a town councilor and have rendered a letter to each town council member. My intentions are clear, honest, and concise, and I ask for your attention. If I may, through the chairman, I would like to distribute a copy of my letter to each council member. Do you want to give them all to me and I'll pass them down? Oh. Pass those that way. I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you very much, sir. Anyone else? OK, moving on. Uh, town manager's report. Deb, could you do me a favor and get the last light? 
I just wanted to show a couple of slides of a couple of activities in the last month. Uh, this is uh, Chairman Lennon with Ann Burke. Uh, and it, you can just see Kathy Ray sticking out the, the far right corner. Didn't mean to cut you off, uh, Kathy. Uh, but I, I think everyone's aware that uh, Mrs. Burke retired uh, a little while ago, but her, she and her husband Wallace Burke ran the Cape Cottage Post Office for over 65 years. And the town council, she, she wasn't really up to coming to a town council meeting, but uh, the council uh, prepared a plaque uh, to recognize the, the, the uh, exceptional service of uh, Mrs. Burke over the years. And there was a ceremony down at the post office uh, within the last month uh, at which that was presented. Uh, there was also a uh, framed uh, plaque uh, with, a, with a Mary Cassatt stamp uh, presented by uh, the postmaster of Portland, uh, uh, Postmaster Bugby. And uh, again, this shows uh, the familiar scene for those that were in the post office from time to time. Also did want to mention, un un unrelated, uh, that the inside of the tower at Portland Headlight just had major repair. And since not too many people get in there too often, I thought I'd show a few slides of that. Uh, this shows uh, this, the stairway. As you can see, it's all been painted. You can see the walls. Uh, this shows they heated it with the, the uh, propane tanks usually aren't there. Uh, but they were there because they, they had to heat the, uh, the inside of the tower while they were painting. But a, a couple months ago, if you looked at this, it was all peeling paint. It was lead paint. Uh, and Greg Marles oversaw this project, uh, working uh, with an uh, area contractor. And as you can see, the walls were all cleaned, painted. Uh, the stairways as well, uh, quite a difference. Uh, this is a, just another photo up near the top of the tower. Uh, you can see where the light's coming from the top of the tower. And this is just when you do get to the top, this is a little bit of the view that you see. But anyway, uh, it was, uh, a, the project cost about $40,000. Uh, it, it did involve the abatement of the lead paint with uh, all proper safeguards. And uh, just wanted to update you on those two projects. So the, the project of uh, the lighthouse as well as uh, 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 Chairman Lennon. Uh, congratulating uh, Mrs. Burke, so thank you. Thank you. Is there any chance we can cut these floodlights? I can't see. Thank you. Um, review of the draft minutes from January 9th meeting. Uh, do I have a motion? Dave? Move to approve. Any changes or amendments? All those in favor? Unanimous. Um, next item is a public hearing on the sewer rates. Uh, I'd like to have Mike just give a quick summary, but before I do, I just want to thank a few people quickly. Mike for um, providing the financial direction and overseeing the project. Bob Malley for being the liaison to the town. Chris Dwinall. Sorry, can never get his name. Twinell. Twinell, thank you. The combined sewer flow, um, combined sewer overflow engineer who did all the hands-on work and gave us a very comprehensive report on the shortcomings and needs um, and produced a, a background work uh, for us to make a decision. So uh, with that, Mike, do you want to just give a, here I'll show you how comprehensive the report was. Do you want to just give a, a, a summary? Yeah, just uh, thank you, Sarah. What's really driving issues issue of sewer rates are, are two, two projects. Uh, one is a re rehabilitation of the Spurwink uh, treatment plant, uh, the, the one that's just down from the recycling area. Uh, that's operated by the Portland Water District. And uh, it's, it's about 25 years old now. Uh, two things, it, it needed updating that anything does that's mechanical, that sewerage runs through uh, after 25 years. And secondly, uh, it, it also, during times of high storm events, uh, it, was, it was bypassing the treatment plan and going out to the outfall off Peebles Cove. Now that will happen almost never, as opposed to more often than we would have liked. Uh, that project was about a $2 million project. Secondly, we, we have a single combined sewer overflow remaining. A combined sewer overflow is when all of the pipes can't handle all of the infiltration into the system during heavy rain events. The one uh, combined sewer overflow that's left is on uh, the South Portland Cape Elizabeth line down at Ottawa Road. This is the report that, that Sarah held up. Uh, that project 
is, is being jointly done with South Portland, but again, between the two communities, it's about a $4 million project. Our cost might be about half of that. Therefore, you know, rather than do sewer rates, you know, one big jump at once, the town council uh, has looked at it more long term. Uh, three years ago, there was a sewer rate increase adopted. It, it was known it was going to be enough uh, once the, these pro two projects actually got going. And this particular proposed increase uh, increases the minimum by, th by almost $3 on March 1, by another $3 March 1 the following year per month, by $3 in 2014, and by $2 on March 1, 2015. Uh, in addition to that, the incremental rate, that which you, you pay for the amount of water uh, going into your home, that goes up 3% each year. Overall, it's a little over, uh, cumulatively, a 20% increase, but it comes in those 2 to $3 increments uh, each year. Thank you very much. Would anyone like to speak on this topic? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing um, and entertain a motion for item 37-2012 on sewer rates. Dave? Uh, I'm not going to read the entire uh, excerpt from the materials, but I would move that the council adopt or revise and adopt the sewer service charge and schedule in accordance with the materials we've been provided with tonight. Seconded. Any comments? Yeah. Yes, um, I have some questions. Um, I was um, wondering if Mike could just give me, or all of us rather, a very brief history of why our sewer use rate is so much higher in South Portland. I know it, it's something that has been talked about through the years, and I've always wondered that. <clears throat> I know it's not, not what we're voting on tonight, but that's one of my couple questions. Yeah, it's, uh, our sewer rates are higher than most every other community basically because of the, the topography of Cape Elizabeth as well as the density of the areas served by sewer. Uh, the, the topography, the glacier has tr treated Cape Elizabeth really well in providing a lot of scenic vistas, a lot of high points along the way. Uh, the, if you think of the coastline of Cape Elizabeth, uh, there's all these rock outcropping, shore acres for instance, uh, some along Shore Road. And what happened is when that glacier came through, it created valleys and it created high spots. All the little valleys require pumping. We actually have more pump stations where you have to push the sewerage forward than the entire city of Portland. Portland feeds mostly by gravity. We have, in fact, I think it's more than double what the city of Portland has in, in terms of pump stations. Uh, we also, again, because of that wonderful glacier, whenever we've done sewer work, uh, we're doing it through ledge. Uh, not as, not as, in, not, uh, it's more expensive than doing it through, uh, you know, more normal ground that, that isn't ledge. Uh, third is, is, as I mentioned, you know, our general density, uh, you know, w with some bigger lots, with uh, the areas served, neighborhoods being separated by each other, there's more pipe in the ground, it's, it's more expensive. And also, as a result of all that, a result of really, some really old sewers, particularly in the northern end of town, that originally were just lines that dumped all into the ocean until the early 1970s, uh, those lines are needing to be replaced. And as those are, again, we're in those very narrow roads, those, those neighborhoods that are expensive to navigate with a lot of ledge, and it's a lot more expensive. So it's all those reasons. It's, but it, it's mainly uh, based on the topography of the community. Okay. Um, and and um, Chairman Lennon, my, my next two questions are probably should be directed to the engineer if that's uh, appropriate They're not here, but time. we'll give it a try. Oh, they're not here. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought they were. Trying to cut costs down. Okay. Well, I just, I was just very curious um, as to what the community, South Portland and Cape Elizabeth, Cape Elizabeth have agreed on the 1-1 solution to the combined sewage overflow, and I just wanted very brief, what is that, what is that solution? Number two, I, I found this, um, I had a question about the smoke. There is an appendix in here that deals with all the smoke testing, and apparently one of the ways they find out that there is a problem in various neighborhoods is that smoke just starts coming up through the ground, where, what have you, and I was just curious as to what causes that. But I, I don't know that anyone can answer that tonight. You want to handle the smoke test question, Bob? You can handle both if you'd like. <laughs> the smoke in this room? 
<laughs> Not the smoke out of the smoke driveway tonight. Uh, <laughs> the, the smoke testing is we, they'll pump smoke through the system. For example, if someone has a, a catch basin or a driveway grate that's connected to the sanitary sewer system, they'll pump sewer th uh, smoke through a sewer manhole, and if that smoke comes up through the catch base, ah, it means it's connected okay. to the system, which means it's an illicit connection and it's not supposed to be in there. So, so that, that's an indicator of a leak, of a, a, a breach of the system. Exactly. So the smoke is not being created. It, it is. It is being created. Well, I mean, by, by, by the problem. No, not at all. No, not smoke definitely. is introduced exactly. to find, okay, because I was thinking, okay, well, I know there's methane, there's all kinds of nasty things, that, but smoke, I didn't know. But so it's artificially induced in order to find leaks. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and Mike, if you, do you know what that, or maybe Bob, I'm sorry, that brief, whatever that the solution of what we're paying $2 million for, what, what are they actually going to do very briefly? One of the challenges we had when we did the report was trying to find an acceptable mitigation level that the DEP would accept. And so we've submitted the report, and uh, so we're waiting to hear a response from them, but there was four or five different mitigation levels that we could have picked and all with various <coughs> expenses connected to them. So um, I think we ended, I'm not sure which, where we ended up, but it was at a reasonable level that we thought that wasn't the highest, mm -hmm. but it wasn't the lowest, but we felt there was one that at the end of the day, DEP would accept uh, so we could move forward. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but it's so, very technical. So is it a, like a brand new pump station or is it a not combination? Not necessarily. Of what we're going to do, assuming the report's approved, we need to do some data collection. We need to do some house to house surveys to find out if there are sump pumps connected to the system because that's really where a lot of the flow is coming from. Uh, we didn't find any smoking guns, you might say. We didn't find catch basins in the street that were connected to the sanitary sewer system. Those would be very obvious, very easy to eliminate. But what we found was a lot of, you know, perimeter drains of homes, uh, that a lot of extraneous flow coming into the system that now we need to go into the houses to see where it's actually coming from. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Can you tell me what the average cost increase for the average homeowner would be over these years? Uh, you know, if the, if the average they're paying right now is about uh, $53, uh, over the course of, of this time period, it would go up by about $20. Thank you. Uh, $15. Yeah. 15 I'm sorry. And that's over five Yeah, 20, yeah. It's about 20%. Yep. Yeah. My math isn't too quick anymore, Dick. Are there comments? All those in favor? Unanimous. <clears throat> the next item on our agenda <clears throat> is the Fort Williams Park Master Plan Update uh, public hearing. Uh, I'd like to just give a few thanks before I open it up to a public hearing. Um, there's so many people to thank, but, but most notably, um, high praise to all members of the Fort Williams Advisory Committee. They've done just an enormous amount of work, months and months of meetings, and great cooperative work and discussion to put this plan together, uh, with a special nod to Bill Nickerson as their chair. Um, to John Mitchell and his team at Mitchell and Associates for um, doing great work and putting together this beautiful final report. <clears throat> uh, again, to Bob Malley for guidance and support. And, um, and we appreciate just the many hours of, of research, meetings, cooperative effort it took from all of you, and I'm sure many, many more people that I've forgotten to mention. Jim Walsh, thank you, um, to arrive at where we are. So. John, did you want to? Uh, Bill, 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 you're going to give the, thank you. We're going to have just a, a very quick um, PowerPoint report before we open up for comments. And this is Bob Metcalf from Mitchell and Associates. Oh, thank yeah. you. They get confused with one. John a lot. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Especially on the phone. Good evening, and thank you, Councilor Lennon, for your kind remarks. Uh, I'm Bill Nickerson, Chairman of the uh, Fort Williams Advisory Commission. I'm going to make a very brief introduction, just give people a little bit of a background as to why we did this at this time. 
Um, the the uh, comprehensive plan of the town of Cape Elizabeth recommends that the master plan of Fort Williams Park be updated every seven years. So that was the primary impetus for us uh, doing it at this time since the last one was done in 2003. During this time, we've solicited a lot of community input. Um, we had a uh, town-wide survey through the website. We had uh, meetings with interest groups within the park, such as the people who walk their dogs there, the Little League, uh, Goddard Mansion, Friends of Goddard Mansion, people involved with the Arboretum, and a number of others. So we tried to elicit input from people who have specific interests within the park, and then we had a public forum in September which was open to the community to come and, and provide uh, whatever guidance they had. We believe that the product that we've ended up with is uh, straightforward, easy to understand, easily readable, um, has been broken down in different sections which address areas of the park as well as uh, topical areas such as pedestrian circulation, traffic circulation, and things of that sort. Overall, there are 90 recommendations, or I guess 92 or 3 recommendations. Many of them are relatively small and wouldn't involve much time or an awful lot of money to take care of. Others clearly are much more significant and will require significant funding. Um, we we as, a, as a commission prioritized 10 of the more major recommendations, which uh, the master plan has um, cost numbers associated with. And those are simply, we as a, as a group each went through, uh, recommended our top 10, then we, we scored them and consolidated them. Um, that is to try to provide some focus. We recognize this is a fluid document. There's nothing magic about these 10 recommendations. It's simply that we tried to try to break it the 90 so, uh, down to, to a smaller number. And we've been very fortunate to be able to work with Bob Metcalf and John Mitchell and others at uh, Mitchell and Associates through this process. They've provided terrific guidance and, and help and I think have come up with a wonderful um, master plan. So with that, I will turn it over to Bob Metcalf to provide a short um, PowerPoint presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Bear with me as I'm going to get used to Mike's little laptop here. Uh, I am Bob Metcalf with Mitchell & Associates, and Bill has pretty much highlighted uh, the role in which we went forward with trying to update the previous plan, which was done in 2003, and also in evaluating the plan that was done in 1990. Uh, Bill pretty much went through the purpose of the master plan to reaffirm the overall vision, goals, and objectives, to continue to guide the town, the Fort William Advisory Commission, its deliberations and establish a framework for decision making to identify new issues of concerns as well as future needs and improvements and to suggest recommendations, propose design concepts for various projects and identify the process. And as the chair had uh, shown the, the document we've put together, I'm, by no means am I going to go through all that. Uh, as Bill indicated, there were a little over 90 recommendations that were put together. Uh, some of them were ranged primarily from maintenance uh, requirements, some other improvements as well as getting into some more hard, fast improvements that the Commission turned around and prioritized. Uh, and most of those really became around public safety in terms of vehicular and pedestrian circulation, as well as several recommendations made to uh, improvements to the park that have the potential for generating revenue, which would provide an important source to help offset the maintenance costs for the park itself. Uh, the 2003 plan had broken the park into 10 distinguishable areas. Uh, and as Bill indicated, the report basically goes through each one of these areas with recommendations. Uh, we did a complete study and reanalysis of the park to identify improvements that had been made from the 2003 and the 1990 plan, as well as identify any issues and changes that have occurred since 2003, specifically any deterioration, erosion, as well as traffic and pedestrian circulation issues that have arisen. And the 10 areas that you have are the Meadow and Chapel Road area, which are immediately on the left of the main access road coming in off of Shore Road. The Goddard Mansion out to Battery Keys, Battery Knoll, the high rise area. Uh, the Cliff Walk are along the perimeter of the park, Portland Headlight Grounds, and the Green and Battery Gresh, and I probably pronounced that wrong again for the 15th time. 
the pond to the parade grounds, Officers Row, where the larger buildings are up closer to Shore Road, uh, Battery Blair, the central parking area in the Southwest Preserve, which is the area to the far end of the park where the dog walking area occurs. Uh, the way we broke out the recommendations, we looked at circulation and parking issues, signage or wayfinding in the park, utilities, including looking at uh, potential for bringing in uh, public sewer and or restroom facilities to the park, reevaluating some of the structures, including the batteries, uh, the park ecology, looking at the overall landscape, the integrity of the park, the uh, invasive species uh, problems at the park, landscape materials and features for improvements that could be made to the park, and some of those were enhancements from the 2003 plan, as well as park management, administration, and maintenance issues. And what I'm going to do is take you through the 10 priorities that Bill had uh, discussed that the Commission came up with. Uh, priority one and priority two. Priority one is re improvements for the Ship Cove parking area, and priority two is for the beach picnic area. And the improvements proposed for the parking lot area, currently the parking lot ends roughly in this area. There's no physical maneuverability for vehicles to turn around at the present time and it causes a lot of congestion and the parking is full. And what we proposed on this is to create a turnaround that takes up some of the lawn area, replaces some of the pavement that's actually remaining from the original fort in connection to Goddard Mansion, provides an additional 23 spaces, provides the ability for vehicles to come in and exit back out as a connection that continues out to provide maintenance and vehicle access to battery keys and then improves on the pedestrian circulation that goes up to Goddard Mansion. The second priority is to make improvements to the existing picnic structure, which is an old concrete slab on a building foundation from a building that is a relic from the fort. Uh, currently, that concrete slab is in deterioration and is a freeze thaw issue where if something isn't done within the immediate future, it's going to wind up deteriorating and going to the point where it would probably have to be removed. So the recommendation on this is for replacing that concrete slab, looking at putting some additional safety railing around the perimeter. Uh, these improvements would uh, provide an enhanced picnic area with the potential for rental uh, of that picnic space as one of the... Uh, uh, generators for income. In the lower left-hand corner of the uh, prioritization, you'll note estimated costs. Those are based on today's dollars. Estimation for making those improvements as well as design cost, permitting costs, and construction administration. So those are rough budget numbers for each one of these improvements. The uh, next is priority three which is a group reception area. And what we looked at was another alternative area to provide rental space for receptions at the park. Uh, it's an increased demand uh, identified in the park for people that have functions. Currently, this area is used for some activity. And what we've identified as an area in the upper westerly corner of the overflow parking area. Uh, some of the improvements uh, that we'd be looking at is some improvements in terms of the grade and the, uh, the grass area up there, but also bringing in power and uh, water service for that particular area. Right now, there are a couple of remnant sidewalks from an old building that was located in this area, and the grade changes at this location, so there's a separation. The views from this area are spectacular looking out to the, the harbor. Priority four are improvements along Cliff Walk. Uh, evaluation of that is in identifying some safety issues where the trail, the pathway in this location here drops off. And there are several other locations along the walkway where that occurs. And what we're looking at here is uh, to provide some sort of guardrail that is sensitive to the visual aspect, something that's non-intrusive but also provides that protection uh, along the, uh, the walkway itself to prevent people from being able to, to go up too close to the edge uh, and uh, fall off. The next priority, uh, oops, skipped over something, is priority five, which is improvements to intersections of Ocean Road and the overflow at Wheatley. And that is this location right in here. 
Ocean Road starts, it's running around the side. This is Wheatley Road. And as you may be able to see in here, it's a rather acute angle trying to turn into that location to get up into the overflow parking. And the proposed recommendation for that is to create a 90 degree intersection with Ocean Road. And you can see this is the current alignment that exists in here. That is to get it so that you can have maneuverability of cars and not having a stacking problem, as well as being able to get larger vehicles, buses uh, that may go up in the other park. Uh, there'd be some improvements in terms of uh, retaining walls to do that. Uh, part of the other improvements would be looking at some pedestrian improvements to provide a crosswalk to get to the other side of Ocean Road. The next improvement is along the cent along Powers Road, which is the main access road, and the central power station, that one building off to the right-hand side as you come in. Uh, the situation of the building is relatively stable. However, the roof area is leaking and creating potential, creating deterioration between a uh, freeze-thaw uh, that, uh, as well as, you can see a little bit of vegetation here, there's been erosion of the embankment behind the building. It's encroached down onto the lower roof section and there's vegetation moss uh, growing on the roof. And uh, as I said, there's infiltration coming into the roof line. The proposal on this is to remove all of that material and to put a bituminous uh, membrane uh, across the roof of the, uh, the power structure in order to preserve the integrity of that and keep it from any further deterioration until any other uses determined for that facility. Priority seven is looking at improving the intersection of Ship Cove. Uh, currently, the way the access comes out of Ship Cove, that is the pavement edge right now. So it's a very wide open intersection that occurs in here. It's rather difficult sometimes for people negotiating coming out as well as traffic coming out of the park. Uh, seeing and having the visibility of what's uh, the traffic exiting. So the proposal on this is to narrow it down to a, a true divided travel way for entering and exiting to create a larger landscaped area in this area, expanding the sidewalk improvements up along this side of ocean. And then these are some of the sidewalk improvements on this side of ocean that ultimately comes up towards Wheatley and that uh, turnout area that's in the upper right hand side. Improvements would also include uh, crosswalk connections as well as landscaping uh, that would occur in those areas. Priority eight is um, looking at um, uh, improvements in the maintenance area. I just lost myself. In the maintenance area, uh, currently, as you can see through, there's a large island. There's a little bit of disjointed parking that occurs around here, and this is probably a one of the heaviest use areas in terms of different functions that are going on. You have the new playground area. You have a little league field in here. This is the dog walk area of the park. Uh, there's a tennis court and basketball courts up in here, as well as the maintenance facility operation that occurs in this location. And the proposed improvements for that area is to actually configure some parking that actually functions, has true def definition, provides pedestrian vehicular circulation, uh, we're looking at probably about a 50% increase in parking spaces, bringing up to a total of 81 spaces. This is looking at probably as a gravel surface area with some end islands to help define what the, uh, the parking spaces would be. Priority nine is looking at a second picnic structure uh, with the opportunity of having as a rental uh, opportunity. That would be located on this side of Merriam Road, the large open green uh, part of the park, and headlight is over here. This is your multi-purpose field in this location. And essentially this is a, a structure, the square footage of this is similar in square footage to the existing picnic structure that you have in the park. Uh, it's remote in the sense that it's separated from the green area, provides some privacy, it's elevated and has views out towards the, uh, towards the harbor, as well as the potential for pedestrian access and connection to the central parking area, which is located in this area up in here. And then the last recommended improvement is for parking for the existing picnic structure, was, which is an open gravel uh, area right now, which is very poorly defined and very difficult to 
uh, get efficient parking in that location. And this would be the proposed improvements to expand a little bit, provide more of a vegetated buffer along Ocean Road, and provide some defined parking. Again, this would be a gravel parking lot uh, with some end islands to help define what those parking spaces would be. And by creating this configuration, uh, right now there's roughly 22 spaces and there would uh, be a net gain of five parking spaces. So those are the 10, <clears throat> excuse me, the 10 priorities. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those for you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay. I'm going to open up to a public hearing. So if, if you want to come up and speak or ask questions. <clears throat> You don't have to. You can. I, I just have one question. What uh -huh. is the, total of this? the total? Do you know what the total is? I don't have the exact total, but it's a little over seven hundred seven hundred sixty thousand dollars for all of the proposed improvements, and those are not projected to be all done at one time. This is based on over a period of time, as Bill had indicated. The master plan is a seven-year update. And so you'd be looking at being able to prorate these and determine when the budget was available to make these improvements. And that is something the commission and Bob Malley have been working on. It's, it's definitely a long-term project. There's, there's a sort of a wish list that well, if we could do everything we wanted to. Uh, anyone else want to speak to this? Okay, I'll close the public hearing. Uh, so item number 38. Um, do I have a motion? Jim, do you want to make a motion as yeah, the council again, liaison? Again, I, I mirror your comments and thanks to the commission for all their hard work, to uh, Bob Metcalf and John Mitchell of Mitchell Associates for the work that they've done as well. And this has been a priority of the council to get this master plan updated because, the, as we all know, the park has been a significant subject of discussion here in our community for the last several years. Um, I'd like to recommend that the town council refer the master plan update to the planning board um, with the amendments dated January 2012 for Fort Williams and request comments from the planning board within 60 days. This is in conformance with section 19-6-8-D1 of the Cape Elizabeth zoning ordinance. Second. Second. Discussion? Okay. <coughs> Sorry, just as a clarification, I think it's important to emphasize that this is a, a strategic plan for the park. This is not a proposal to spend money. <laughs> and I think that's a significant thing to point out. Do you want to clarify that? <laughs> I think that, I mean, that's a clarification. I mean, we'll, we'll address the costs associated with this over time, but this is laying out a game plan for how we'd like to approach upgrading and improving the park over time. I guess I'd add to that that the, the, one of the impetus of doing this was that people expressed an interest in generating revenue from the park. That was how it all began. And that's, we, we, we embraced that and we said, how would we do that? And it became clear that step one was to make it a place that people would want to spend money to go to and host events and so forth. So it's not, as Frank said, just spending money. It's actually trying to make it very nice to ultimately make some money. Any other comments? Jessica? Yeah. Um, I'd just like to echo other comments. I think it's an outstanding document. Um, that will guide the town as we go forward to uh, protect and preserve this incredible um, park that we have. Thank you to everyone who was involved. All those in favor? Unanimous. Item 39 uh, has to do with short-term rentals uh, with a proposed referral to the planning board. Um, we do not have a public hearing on this at this time, but I see some folks here who want to speak on it. And the rules um, say that we can allot 15 minutes for people to speak. Um, I think you all know that there's a three-minute limit. And so um, do you want to talk first or have them speak? Well, I just, uh, I, I think as a backdrop to sure. this citizen input, yeah. which, which we've been doing a lot of, we've had six meetings on this subject. Um, and we have had over 100 citizen comments. The meetings have been held at 8 o'clock in the morning. We've, there's been no shortage of uh, participants from our community um, to weigh in and give us guidance and uh, direction. Um, at the meeting in uh, January, of course, we've also had two different ordinance committees to deal with this. We had the ordinance committee from last year, which Frank was a member, and Ann Swift-Kayata was a member. And then the new, new ordinance committee with uh, 
you know, with Kathy Ray and with David. Um, so it, we've had a lot of input, and I believe what we've presented here, um, you know, it's not the final document by any way, shape, or form. What we are hoping to do here is to move it to the planning board and the planning board in its own um, approach will involve citizen input as well. So, um, and our hope is that we'll get a recommendation back from them where again, we'll come back to citizen input here at the town council level. And then this town council can then make a decision at that time what it wishes to do, which may be to push it back to the ordinance committee for all, you know, which, was, which is a possibility. <laughs> um, I think at the end of the day, um, I think this has been a, a good example of, um, of citizen input and uh, collaboration and um, doing the kind of research necessary to try to solve a problem that, uh, that clearly needs to be addressed. So on that note, I'm anxious to hear citizen thank input you. again. Thank you. And I would like to thank the Ordinance Committee, both of them, which <laughs> includes most of the counselors here, and also uh, all the people who showed up to all the meetings. It's not easy to get there in the morning, and they were long meetings, and I've said this a lot, but it's what makes Cape Elizabeth great is people's involvement and passion. So thank you for showing up all those times and continuing to be here now. So anybody who would like to speak to this issue, please come forward and do so. Good evening. My name is Patty Grennan. I've lived at 8 C Barn Road for 32 years. In my opinion, short-term renting neighborhoods with lots under 30,000 square feet is not an appropriate use of a single-family dwelling. Living next to an ongoing influx of weekly rentals is disruptive to neighborhood life. Renters come with vacationing energy and maximize the use of the property morning to night. There is constant hum of people, cars, and noise. For the past two years, the two rentals that flank our property have rented weekly to as little as eight and as many as 24 people May through October. They offer nightly, weekend, and weekly rental options. Busloads of renters have arrived for weddings and school breaks. In the two years, that's nearly 1,000 transient people passing through our neighborhood. To address this issue, the draft ordinance regulates parking and limits the number of people per rental to 12. What single family, I'll ask you, has 12 people in it? I challenge you to find one permanent family in Cape with 12 people under one roof. Instead of limiting to a number per bedroom, I suggest that the term single family be defined. Other communities have successfully defined family to uh, one, regulate the number of people renting a home, and two, deter homeowners from renting to large groups to maximize income. Although I am completely sympathetic with all the reasons that drive people to rent their home, usually to pay taxes, renting your home in a high turnover manner, generating income in excess of $100,000 goes way beyond paying property taxes. These short-term rentals are businesses operating in residential neighborhoods. Four counselors have stated this fact. One counselor said, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it is a duck. If that is the belief, why not declare these rentals as such and regulate accordingly? Now, let's compare tight B&B regulations in town proposed um, that the ordinance, that or, excuse me, the council has proposed. In 2009, after hearing that B&Bs would negatively impact residential neighborhoods, the council voted to allow B&Bs in residential zones only if they Front Shore Road or 77 have sufficient lot size and the owner lives on the property. My question to you is why would anyone bother getting a B&B business permit when they can, like my neighbors, operate a pseudo B&B renting as short as a night and don't have to live on the property to run and police it? We should address this hypocrisy by either loosening the regulations for B&Bs or tightening the ordinance for short-term renting. Finally, in the draft ordinance, I ask you to eliminate or limit short-term weekly rentals. The high-frequency short-term rental business belongs only in commercial or large lot residential zones. In closing, short-term rentals are businesses operating in residential neighborhoods. The transient nature and impact of large numbers of renters permanently changes the character of a neighborhood. A butter's experience impacted and diminished property values, burden of policing, the noise, traffic, and partying, loss of tranquility and privacy, and a diminished sense of safety. Counselors, carefully consider the negative impact weekly renting is causing and tighten the ordinance to reflect strengthen and protect the residential character of our coastal neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Mary Volan. I live at 17 Lawson Road. I've been there for over 30 years. I would like to focus on the most serious consequence of this ordinance. 
it legitimizes a business activity which takes property values from abutters is inconsistent with the true intent of single family zoning and will hurt our community. Because of the nuisance value of living next to a short term rental, it is unlikely a family would want to purchase my home as a primary residence. From a white paper prepared by the National Association of Realtors, in residential neighborhoods where the existence of short term rentals is considered a negative, an ordinance that prohibits future short-term rental activity in those neighborhoods could positively affect the value of homes in these locations. Why would values go up? Because residents would be spared the worry of devaluation caused by short-term rentals. The maximum density in my neighborhood has never been more than 1.6 people per bedroom. The ordinance allows 2.0 plus guests. The committee cited a document we supplied from the General Council of the State of New York as supporting a cap on density rather than defining single family. Ignored was the statement, quote, a strict quantitative approach may lead to the opposite result from which the decisions endorse a stable single family area. The same document outlined approaches to definitions of single family, which have held up in court. A single family shares the entire house, <coughs> lives and cooks together as a single housekeeping unit, shares household expenses, and is permanent and stable. How could permanence of family unit be determined? A lease of more than 28 days. Short-term rentals promoted on the internet are a relatively new phenomena. I cannot produce quantitative evidence that short-term rentals devalue residential neighborhoods. I cannot wait 10 years for graphs and tables and studies. All I can do is apply common sense. I will quote from the judicial decision supporting the Carmel, California ordinance. Quote, it stands to reason that the residential character of a neighborhood is threatened when a significant number of homes are occupied not by permanent residents, but by a stream of tenants staying a weekend, a week, or even 29 days. Such rentals undoubtedly affect the essential character of a neighborhood <clears throat> and the stability of a community. Short-term tenants have little interest in public agencies or in the welfare of the citizenry. They do not participate in local government, coach Little League, or join the hospital guild. They do not lead a scout troop, volunteer at the library, or keep an eye on elderly neighbor neighbors. Literally, they are here today and gone tomorrow. Sorry, you'll have to wrap up. Apologize. That's okay. Thank you very much. Eddie Crane, Starboard Drive. Um, thank you, Ordinance Committee, for all your eight o'clock meetings. However, I didn't make them all. It's not my favorite kind of time of day. But I know how hard you work. And I think at this point, we are facing the tip of the iceberg. This is only the beginning on the Cape of what could possibly happen. And I think more study, and I understand this ordinance committee is going to go on working on this. I feel they have a golden opportunity to write an ordinance which will apply to all neighborhoods. There won't be any, well, here, there, not here, not there. I think we can work hard and have this develop this ordinance which will take care of this problem. Because I have a feeling it's going to spread. It's already spread a little bit on the Cape, on the waterfront part of the Cape that we're talking about, but there's lots of waterfront and lots of houses that could have this happen, lots of neighborhoods. I hate, I sympathize with the people having lived in Ponco Park for 21 years, which was, Bob and I have been married for, I don't know, 64 or five years. We've had wonderful neighborhoods everywhere we've gone. But Ponco Park was absolutely the very best. It was an open door neighborhood. Everybody loved each other. We all got along. And to have this happen just breaks my heart. And I don't want to see it spread in Cape Elizabeth. 
and I hope that the Ordinance Committee will go on and do some more studying and see if we can't come up with something that will be fair to everybody. I'm especially worried about how it can be enforced. I think this is going to be a stickler, but I'm sure you can do it. I appreciate all the work you've done, and thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, Jim Hubner, 13 Kettle Cove Road. I also own the house next door, 11 Kettle Cove Road, that I operate as a short-term rental in the summertime. Um, I realize the property abuts mine, so I am not going to be subject to all the proposed rules in, in the proposed ordinance. Um, but I still think the changes are unnecessary puts an unnecessary burden, administrative burden, on the property owner, on the town, and uh, it's a potential hindrance to the use of my property. Unless there's some other information that's become available, there's been one complaint since 1997, according to the code enforcement officer. And that was in November uh, of 2011, just last year. And uh, I think all this, is my understanding, centers around one house. And I guess, right or wrong, we're going to impose this burden on all the short-term rentals in the whole town because of one house. The code enforcement officer has made it clear that the ordinances are already in place to deal with a problem such as noise, such as parking. So I'm not sure what else, you know, I, I just don't see the need for this. Um, there are three other properties in my neighborhood that I've been to, uh, 1988, never had any problems. The owners have had never had any problems with these renters who live in the Kettle Cove area. Um, the, uh, let's see, excuse me. In short, I think this is a solution in search of a problem. Um, I just don't see the need for it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hubner. Thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter Clifford. I live at 36 Lawson Road. Um, I want to respectfully disagree. I think on Lawson Road, as you've heard from many of us, there's at least, at least three houses that have been a problem. And we're all terrified. And I'm also an attorney, and I've represented the Grennans for, that, uh, for their horrible situation with their neighbor. I can't imagine personally living next to the house that was involved because there were loud parties. The neighbor who has since passed on just didn't care. And with the development of the internet, it's a disaster that's going to happen and potentially ruin a lot of the neighborhoods in Cape Elizabeth. So I think it's a major problem. Uh, and I just uh, I appreciate the committee's hard work looking at the ordinance. The one thing I noticed today when I looked at it is uh, there is no real definition of nuisance or, or partying. And one of the things I think that might be helpful for the ordinance is to have a way for if, if people, for example, the neighbors of the Grennans in the future act up, some sort of mechanism to say, wait a minute, you're partying at 3 in the morning, you've got a short-term rental contract, the owner has a short-term license, um, there has to be some maybe a definition of nuisance. So if, with the council's permission, I've got 10 or 11 copies of a Lake Ware, North Carolina ordinance, which I previously submitted to the council, and it does include a potential nuisance definition. While I've got, I guess, uh, 30 seconds or so, I'll just briefly read it so, so people, if I do have the time, I You've I got don't. a minute and 15 seconds. Okay, I'll try to be fast then. Um, the sample definition of, of a nuisance, which I think would help this ordinance a lot if the committee decides to go in this direction, is as follows. Occupants and guests shall conduct themselves in accordance with provisions of this section, the town code or any other applicable federal, state, or county ordinance, uh, or rule or regulation pertaining to nuisance, noise, disorderly conduct, trespass, illegal consumption of alcohol, or use of illegal drugs. My hope is, is if that behavior took place, that that permit would be revoked and people wouldn't be able to do that. Very simple concept. That probably would have solved the Grennan's problem. And I think the current ordinance doesn't have that. 
The last point I want to make is I think I do agree with what I've heard from others that a 28-day um, term or one-month term, in my opinion, would balance the needs of people that want to rent their houses um, against the needs of the neighbors. Uh, it's a major problem. I think weekly rentals in a single-family neighborhood are just unfair and contrary to the nature of what a single-family neighborhood is. And I think if somebody wants to do daily or weekend rentals, it's really a bed and breakfast. I don't see any distinction between those two concepts. So I would say put in a nuisance section like I'm proposing and limit rentals to one month. And I think this would be a very fair and very balanced ordinance. So with the council's permission, I'd like to share the draft ordinance. Maybe just pass it over here. Thank you very much. My name's Jenny Aarons, and I also live on Lawson Road, 27 Lawson Road. And I haven't been able to go to any of the meetings, but I wanted to speak out against the ordinance as it's written for all the reasons that Patty Grennan stated. And I just wanted to give you a realistic view. I don't know if this has been given, but we live on a very short J-shaped street. It's really a little neighborhood. And if I was at home full time when my children were young, and children run all over that neighborhood. The neighborhood has been transformed over the last couple of years. I guess it's because of the rise of the internet and certain um, owners are starting to rent. I would never let my children run around that neighborhood now. It has nothing to do with the specific nuisance of people being drunk or up, up late and loud. I mean, certainly that's an outrage. But having strangers coming into your neighborhood every weekend or every week and walking around and having their friends from Portland come over and parking and walking around and you've got your kids in the yard and you don't know who these people are, you know, it's not a very nice feeling. And it's changed the atmosphere of the neighborhood. So I would expect as stringent a control as possible. Um, I, I understand there's a need to balance um, other homeowners' needs, but you're ruining um, people who want a residential neighborhood's need. Thank you, Ms. Aaron. David Voland, 17 Lawson Road, and uh, before I get into some remarks I've prepared, I just wanted to reinforce some of the things the other folks have said uh, regarding the growth of this phenomenon. There are at least two or three other houses in the Lawson Road neighborhood that could conceivably in the next two or three years be sold. <clears throat> and among the concerns we have is that when people get word of the tremendous amounts of money some of these rentals can earn, more of those homes will become short-term rentals. The vast majority of short-term rentals in Cape Elizabeth are on lots of over 30,000 square feet and will be little affected by the ordinance. Dense neighborhoods with small lots are, problems, are where problems arise and the nuisance factor threatens home values. A stricter ordinance in these neighborhoods would affect a small minority of the short-term rentals while positively stabilizing property values for a large majority of primary residences. The ordinance supports financial benefits for the few while largely ignoring the negative impacts on the majority. Rentals in dense neighborhoods with small lots, as Pete indicated, should be for 30 days or more. Why didn't the ordinance committee exert a greater effort to review the short-term rentals in other communities. And the explanation we heard was that the term baby steps was used to describe the thinking of the draft ordinance. Unfortunately, once an ordinance is adopted, it is difficult to amend, especially if it is viewed as grandfathering the existing short-term rental businesses. Practically speaking, the ordinance is unlikely to be reviewed for several years if passed in its current state. If a year was spent on roosters, I think this potential community-altering ordinance deserves more time, more public input, and closer study. And I'd like to understand what the Council's next steps would be. I understand it's got to go to the Planning Committee and other locations. I would also like to mention that when we do get to the voting, when the Council eventually <laughs> votes on this, due to the emotional nature of this issue, I would suggest that those members who abut or own short-term rentals recuse themselves from the vote. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jana Zimmerman. I'm at 81 Oakhurst Road. 
And I wanted to, I'm late to this issue, but I had been quite concerned because those who know me know I dodged the bullet of zoning nightmare of Houston, Texas to come here. So I was really surprised to learn that zoning here doesn't preclude something that could be run like a business in a neighborhood. And I live now in a neighborhood in which there are long-term renters, and that somewhat dilutes the nature of a neighborhood. But at least they're there for several months to a year, and at some point you know who they are, you know who they know, and they become a part of your community. If you were faced with a situation in which there are numerous people coming into your neighborhood all the time, my children would begin to live the life that we avoided. We moved away from a big metropolitan area in order for them to be able to play outside, in order for them to have a normal life outside. Well, my daughter always kids that if we were in Dallas, she'd be walking around with armed guard if she was allowed out at all. But here, I can feel comfortable in letting her go outside. I wouldn't be comfortable letting her go to the Grinnan neighborhood because there would be too many strangers there. I let her go to Fort Williams with a lot of concern, but she's always with someone. But I'd have to have that same guarded anxiety about her even if we lived in that neighborhood. And then I would worry, you know I'm a huge school supporter, those who know me, I worry about property values falling of these homes when they're trying to resell. So even though it's not impacting me directly, I have concerns that it's directing in a negative way our community and people like me who move to this community for a very safe place to raise their children will avoid it and then they'll avoid the neighborhoods in which there's these short-term rentals. And so one person is profiting but at the expense of many. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Enderman. Um, we've gone to our 15-minute limit but with the council's indulgence I'd like to just let these last three people speak. Is everyone okay with that? Thanks. Thank you. Um, my name is Janine Forget. I live on 2 C Barn Road. Um, I also am in the middle of the two short-term rental um, places. And I just have a couple of questions, and I know this, these points have already been made, but I'll just ask a couple of these questions. Uh, number one is, why is this ordinance so, less, so much less restrictive than the ordinance on B&Bs? Why, given the same issues of regulating the impact of a lodging business on a butters, is the B&B ordinance so much stricter? The really only meaningful difference is that the owner of the B&B is on the property, actually a huge positive when it comes to ensuring safety and decorum. Having two ordinances that address such similar business models in such a different way does not seem like good government. And the other uh, comment is, um, the state of Maine groups short-term rentals with other lodging businesses and requires collection of 7% sales tax and use tax. Why are short-term rentals not considered businesses by the Ordinance Committee? Why are short-term rentals not required to go through the vigorous approval processes of other businesses in residential zones? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Joan Aldrich. I live at 18 Lawson Road and have lived there since 1993, and thank you for going over time here. I um, stood when the gentleman was commenting that complaints have never been issued in regard to any short-term rentals, with the exception of one, I believe he said in November of 2011. I spoke to this at a zoning board meeting previously. As a neighbor in this lovely, small, and intimate community, I have elected not to complain, even when there have been large gatherings. Uh, the, fam the two dwellings that have been having the largest number of short-term rentals, I regard it as neighbors, and I, I just didn't complain. So I do not think it's a viable way to study the impact by looking at what the code enforcement officer has been called about or what complaints have been filed with the police at all. It is just not a fair measure and it's really reflective of the nature of our neighborhood that we haven't complained. And I mentioned this at another meeting. I have a very ugly looking boat in my driveway covered with a big blue tarpaulin and my neighbors have indulged me in this. I mean, that is the way we are. Um, another point I'd like to make is consider the recent vote about the usage of Fort Williams. 
this town came out in huge numbers against the idea of making it a commercial property where admission fees would be charged. I mean, it was a, you know, if you recall, it was a very impassioned issue. So that is this beautiful park in our Cape Elizabeth town. Now we're speaking about residences in beautiful areas of the town. Why would people want that to become a commercial zone that really is essentially utilized as a bed and breakfast for the gain of some individuals? at the cost of not only these private neighborhoods, but really the whole town, as uh, was mentioned. This is gonna spread. It isn't gonna just be on Lawson Road or a few areas. And it's really about, I think it's just a sign of our times. It's the advent of the internet. It is people looking at short-term benefits instead of the long-term picture. Nobody's even thought about the sewage implications of all of this, folks. Every house in my neighborhood, just about, since I've lived there 19 years, has had to replace its septic system once, and I think one house had to do it twice. And we're also located right on the ocean in this beautiful Pond Cove area. I mean, you have this huge density of people in each of those houses flushing all those toilets. It's something to think about, in my humble opinion. So thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the Council, uh, Mr. McGovern, thank you for the opportunity to speak here tonight. My name is Rob Crawford. I'm attorney at Bernstein Schur, and I represent uh, Jean Armstrong Taylor and her um, brother, um, David Armstrong, and they have property at Three Lawson Road. <clears throat> One of the points I wanted to uh, bring first to your attention is that I don't think the Armstrongs wanted in any way to be uh, adverse to their neighbors um, and adverse to their concerns. And what we would like to echo is the sentiment of, of uh, Mr. Walsh and the group that advanced the ordinance here um, tonight as a measured and appropriate step in trying to address the concerns. People like the Armstrongs have been participants of this community. They no longer live here full time, but for 70 years. And the rental of this property is dear and near to their heart. They'd like to keep their roots that they still have in this community, make it available. Um, in terms of what's been presented to you, there's limitations on the numbers, there's limitations on the safety issues, there are limitations on the parking and the other things that have been metered. Um, one of the signs, I think, of good ref regulation is that it's reasonable and it's specific to the task ahead, has a balanced approach, and it has a measured approach. I mean, you can come back here if this doesn't work on this round and come back and I think uh, David actually echoed that sentiment in our last meeting at the Ordinance Committee to tighten up these regulations. But at this point in time to go too far, to eliminate short-term rentals, to make them overly restrictive, you're going to have impacts, unintended impacts on people like the Armstrongs in terms of their ability to hang on to their property and enjoy it. And certainly every landlord who has short-term rentals, in my view, after this process, is much more aware of the issues and much more willing, I believe, if they're responsible, to take the necessary measures to police and make sure that those tenants that are coming and enjoying their property uh, fall within the rules and they're good citizens and, and good uh, members of the community. I appreciate the opportunity um, to provide these comments. Um, I guess I'm last up and I also thank you for the additional time and the chance to speak. Um, moderate view, we think it's a good one, we support it and uh, can live with the ordinance as, as proposed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, with that, I'll close the public hearing. And why don't we get a motion on the table before we discuss it? Jim, do you want to? I move that, uh, try? that the proposed um, short-term rental um, ordinance that's before you be referred to the planning board. I'll second that. Discussion? I just want to. Uh, just to make sure that everybody understands. I mean, it, sound, say, it sounds like it's a fait accompli that it's done. And I think that people have to understand that we're going to send it to planning, planning with a new, fresh set of eyes. We'll have their process, and that process will listen to, I'm assuming, the same discussion that you've heard tonight, maybe even more. Um, the way this will move, if you vote in the affirmative, um, either Dave Sherman, who is the liaison with the planning board, 
will present this to them for their work, or I will do it, one or the other, because that's the new way that we work with the chair of the planning board. So, um, you know, I you know I feel it's the right step to to get to this next level and let the process work. I mean, it, this document you see in front of you is six meetings, many hours um, of work. So my assumption is that we will continue to work this and the documents will, will improve over time. And hopefully what, what, what we've heard today is just a small sliver of what we listened to in the six meetings. Um, but I really believe the planning board is the next step. Frank? Just a question that, uh, Jim, you could just address, I think, to clarify for everyone in the audience. What would, what would happen to this if the town council voted down sending it to the planning board? It basically would, it would it'd be, it'd be dead, wouldn't it? Uh, it's a proposed amendment to the zoning ordinance. Uh, no amendment to the zoning ordinance can be adopted unless, it unless it's first reviewed by the town council. So if, if this was defeated to refer this, conceivably you'd, at some point you'd want to refer something else if the intent was to have regulations that were stronger. You could also not refer it to the planning board simply because you agree with the viewpoint that this isn't an area that needs any attention. Caitlin? I just had a question that maybe many members from the Ordinance Committee could address. The 30,000 square feet, um, somebody mentioned that a lot of the homes on Lawson Road, which seem to be the focal point of the complaints, aren't even going to qualify within that 30,000 square feet. So all of these regulations that we're proposing aren't even going to affect them, so we're not going to solve any of the complaints. What brought us to the 30,000 square it's feet? It's lots less than 30,000 square feet. So, Wait, so some of these are on 10,000 square foot lots. I mean, these are small clustered together homes that... Right, but I thought what somebody said was that the homes on Lawson Road are more than 30,000 square feet. No, no, no. no. Less. They're, on lots. Less. They're on lots of less than 30,000 gotcha. square feet. Sorry, I misheard. Yeah. We, we, we spent a considerable amount of time talking about that 30,000 sort, of, sort uh -huh. of filter, if you will, because people with two and three and five and 10 acres, it, it doesn't seem to be quite the, the same issue. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's less yeah. than 30,000 square gotcha. feet. Gotcha. Okay. Sorry. Dan? Uh, just to respond a little bit to Frank's question as well. Uh, I think if the council were to vote 7-0 to forward this to the planning board, that doesn't mean we're, everybody here is endorsing the draft as proposed by the ordinance committee. The three members did, uh, but I, I think the idea is to follow the process, send it to the planning board. They'll work on it for as long as they need to. Uh, it may come back to us in very much the same form, or it may look very different. Uh, and that's why we have the planning board look at this. They have a different set of eyes, as Jim pointed out. They have the expertise uh, from serving on the board. Uh, and then we'll get it back in three to four months or, or whatever the time frame is. And then the council as a whole would then have the opportunity to review what we get from the planning board. We will certainly have a public hearing. Uh, in the past, with one very controversial set of zoning amendments, uh, we actually had a special workshop to address it. Uh, doesn't mean this is going to hopefully take too long. but. Uh, it's really more of a procedural decision we make tonight as opposed to a substantive decision. Uh, and on the grandfathering issue, um, I did actually ask the town planner when it goes to the planning board to make sure that issue is addressed, uh, perhaps the legal counsel from the town attorney to make sure we're not boxing the town in. Because I've said many times, I hope I didn't use the word baby step, maybe measured step, but whatever I said, uh, if it doesn't work adequately, I am more than willing to come back and, and try something else out that will. Um, but we will have that issue addressed, sir. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm one of the newer members of the town council and also a new member of the uh, ordinance committee. I have some interesting percep pers perspectives on this particular issue. Um, first of all, uh, some of the folks who've spoken tonight my sense is that maybe they have not completely read the ordinance and understand what we're proposing. Um, some have and some haven't. Um, I know the, the neighborhood very well. My parents lived at 27 Lawson Road for 27 years. Um, and um, 
Interestingly enough, my wedding was had at 27 Lawson Road. Um, Twenty people. Um, uh, more than you would like to know. Um, I remember the discussion. I was young, and my father said, we need to talk to the neighbors. We're going to have a very busy and noisy uh, gathering. He, he commented, and he contacted every neighborhood, every neighbor. And first of all, he told them what we're going to do. Um, we hired a police officer. We also invited all the neighbors to the wedding. Um, so anyway, um, that's sort of a, a side note, but that was about being a good neighbor at the time. Um, and um, I appreciate um, uh, Dr. Aronson for her comments. Um, anyway, um, so I do understand the neighborhood and I do understand the, the, uh, the size of it. Um, I understand also the uh, rentals of, for folks who need to pay their taxes. I'm involved in another issue, and I understand that people want to keep their property, they want to rent it for paying their taxes. Um, and being on the Ordinance Committee, and we did talk and we looked at this, we listened to folks, and we did try to come up with an idea that would um, potentially address it, understanding that maybe we didn't address it, but we wanted to take not necessarily a baby step, but a step to try to address and the concerns of the people involved. Um, we're not sure we did, but we're going to give that a shot and we're going to send it to the uh, planning board. Um, it may not come back the same way from the planning board. It may not pass the town council when it does come back, but we're trying to understand and address the concerns because we want to make sure that um, people are allowed to live and uh, enjoy their properties and not be disturbed by issues that are happening. So um, anyway, um, that's just my sort of my side note. And um, I am committed to revising anything that comes up that um, doesn't work. I have no problem in, in being called and saying, you know what, we've tried this, it's not working, and we need to <clears throat> review it and, and look again. So anyway, those are just my issues, and uh, just wanted to put that out. Thank you. Jessica? Yeah, I'd like, I may, was able to attend a couple of the ordinance meetings, and I'd like to commend the ordinance committee. Um, this is a very tough issue, and I... I'm on public record as <laughs> being very nervous about it because I don't like to see any direction towards infringing anyone's private property rights. But on the other hand, those should not infringe upon the rights of others to enjoy their own property. I think that this step is a very good one because it is, I think it's reasonable. It, I know it does not go nearly as far enough as uh, most of you think tonight. But this is brand new territory for this town, and I think that a, a very measured approach is important. I also like the, um, the proposal of issuing permits because permits can be revoked. And I think that um, emphasizing the safety issues of having too many people in a house, you know, the fire marshal and all that sort of thing is, is a very important way to look at this. Um, so I, I think that the, the Ordinance Committee has, has done a very good job of trying to look at the critical issues with respect to the complaints of the people involved and thinking in terms of, gee, you know, where does sweeping legislation grow, go across an entire town even though the complaints are essentially one neighborhood? And so very important for the people in that neighborhood, but it has to be remembered that, that anything that is ultimately finalized affects everybody in the town. And we certainly know many people who rent in or because they have to, to pay taxes. So I think they've done a good job for a first step in looking at this. Thank you. Um, I agree they've done a great job as a first step. Um, it does affect everybody, but I, I think an important step they took is to divide it into two categories and to leave the larger lots alone, so it, there, we're actually talking about a very small number of houses, i.e. those that are under a third of an acre. Um, 
just to be clear about that. So it's, it's not going to impact everybody who rents a house, only people in very dense neighborhoods. I am in favor of passing this along to the planning board to, to keep the process going. I don't think it would be effective to give it back to the ordinance committee right now. You guys have done a great job. You've done a ton of work, and it's good to get a set of new eyes. Um, I appreciate everything everyone said on both sides. I guess, Dave, if you're the one that talks to the planning board, um, I would, it'd be great if you could communicate some of the major points that were made and <clears throat> points that were made over several people. Uh, Sarah, just uh, the, the night that I meet with the planning board is February 27th at 7 p.m. And if for whatever reason I'm not able to attend, I, I'd ask Jim to. And so all the planning board meetings are open, not that you guys want to keep going to meetings, but I guess the, 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 the major points for me that stick out would be define a family, define nuisance, address frequency and length of stay. Um, and I do think that many people mention the discrepancy between the, the strictness of the bed and breakfast and the, what, they, what they perceive to be a, a looseness with the rentals. And so that might be something the planning board wrestles with a little bit. That's just my opinion. But anyway, um, is there any more comments? Should we move the question? All those in favor of passing this along to the planning board? Unanimous. Thank you. And again, thank you, everyone, for coming out. Just the one that just happened. Yeah, here you go. Take my cup. This is what was um, done. Yeah. This is the new map. Here you go. We got my crib like notes check. and everything. You're right. Check. How's that? Yeah. Why don't you okay. give him my? Take it. No, no. He's got yeah. Why don't you give him my copy there? I just didn't get. It. No, no. You get. You. You've got mine with crib notes and all. Yeah, he can have mine without the notes though. No, I just had notes. I'm all set. Thanks. Is that, is that all right? Great. And, uh, you know, just read it with uh, oh, yeah. an eye to the next round of discussion. Everybody knows. This is the setback issue. Can, can you, excuse me. Should I bang my gal? Can you guys do me a favor and um, talk in the parking lot? Because we have a whole bunch Good. more to go. Okay, great. Take care. Here's your gal. <laughs> Sorry. Can you guys talk in the parking lot? Because we got another many, many items to go on our agenda. Item number 40. Uh, this is about a setback violation that mistakenly occurred at 21 Woodcrest Road in 1999. Uh, does anyone want to? Let me explain it. Sure. Yeah, uh, 21 Woodcrest Road is, is owned by uh, the Howes, who, who are here in the audience. Uh, unlike some other folks, they'd actually like to sell their property sometime. Uh, and what, what they've discovered uh, in looking at selling their property is that their side setback is 8.6 feet instead of the minimum 10 feet. Uh, in the RC zone, every lot is required to have a side setback of at least 10 feet. Uh, you can't get a variance uh, for anything less than that. Uh, the zoning board uh, can't look at the practical difficulty standard because it's not allowed for anything under 10 feet. And, and basically, it's left them in, in the position of either tearing down the garage and the living space above the garage uh, or uh, doing an action similar to what we have today uh, is proposed. Uh, this is, we've gone back and forth with the town attorney a number of times on this. Uh, some towns do what, what's referred to as a letter of non-enforcement. Our town attorney doesn't really feel that's a very uh, uh, wise way to do it because it, it, it very much could bring the problem back. He thinks the best way is to have a, a judicial determination uh, where it actually would file an action in Maine District Court uh, in connection with it. It would be resolved. It'd be a consent agreement. Uh, the owners would pay the town the cost of the action uh, and the code enforcement officer would also review it with the, with the other property owners. Uh, this has been a very cooperative exercise with the house. Uh, with their attorney, with our town attorney, and uh, you know, I'd encourage the council to approve the draft motion as, been, as has been drafted by the town attorney. Uh, he believes uh, it, it uh, will solve it in the long run. The, the other issue we deal with with this is that in, in Oakhurst, you know, we, we keep hearing about these small lots, and a number of places in town, you know, 
the homes are fairly big compared to the size of the lots, so they run into these setback issues. And every so often we'll find one of these that just didn't go in the exact right place. The alternative in the council's considered at times is when folks are putting an addition to actually require a survey. People do not want to pay for the survey at the time. It adds all that additional expense. Uh, and the council has actually debated that. And the council has said, no, we don't want to charge the amount. We realize every so often we're going to uh, come to these situations where we need to find another alternative. <coughs> And, and this is one of those situations. Uh, the next door neighbor uh, on that's by the setback, uh, a couple by the name of Greenfield, they submitted a letter that they're not opposed to this. Bruce Smith has talked to the neighbor that's towards the back. That's uh, it, they've also indicated they're not opposed to this. So this would this would help this property owner uh, at no expense to the town and would allow uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Howe to go on with selling their property. Mike, I'm just still not sure I understand, because uh, the materials we got, I, I guess I don't understand what this court action actually does. Uh, it, it's a judicial determination of what? So that they can get clear, so a, a future property owner would have clear title and could get a mortgage on the property. It's basically an issue involving the title attorneys looking when, when they see a setback on the Class D survey, knowing that uh, it's been taken care of through, through an action and Tom, you know, Tom's a fairly experienced real estate attorney. He does it a lot more than municipal law. And, you know, I just have to defer to his judgment as the best way to solve this. He, I forget who, who was your attorney? Uh, Ken Cole. Yeah, they use Ken Cole, a you know, very prominent municipal attorney. Ken reluctantly agreed, I believe, that this is the best way as well to go about it. And Ken is a much more experienced, nothing against Tom, even though he's been with us 25 years, but Ken Cole is a municipal attorney and deals with uh, these issues more than Tom does. I, I'm happy to support this ultimately, but the, the concern I have is, you know, the mortgage survey explicitly says it's not a boundary survey, you can't rely on it. All it does is place the house in the lot. I don't think these homeowners did anything intentionally wrong. I want to help them out, uh, but maybe the answer is, we require surveys in the future uh, for additions. But th that's, a, I suppose, a question for another day, and maybe it'll be something else we can put on the Ordinance Committee's plate. Um, it just, you know, it, what this invites is build it and then seek forgiveness later. And you get this a lot. And I, I get that we ought to be practical and take a practical approach here. But the concern I have is, well, hey, we, we did it this time, so ultimately these setback rules don't have much meaning. David, I would strongly support that if there's an addition that appears to be within X number of feet of a property <coughs> line, that it, that it needs to be confirmed by a, uh, a regular property survey. It would solve, you know, and it, it's not protecting the town, it's protecting property owners uh, for when they need to sell their property, get mortgages. There's nothing more frustrating right. than when you're about to do that and you find out you can't. You can't solve it, that. It, and the, the house have made a substantial investment in building the addition. It, to, to pay the cost of the survey 15 years ago would have saved a lot of headache today. So. Does the planning board have to review additions? No. No, it was just oh. a building permit. Oh. And, and, the, and the permit showed that it met the setback, and right. yeah. there was no survey to confirm it. So. Kathy. So, so who made the mistake? Who made the mistake? You know, it's it's a, <laughs> you know, if it's close, I suppose we could have demanded a survey take place. Uh, you know, there was there was an architect at the time who, who placed it. You know, it's, you know, I I, I always hesitate to sit up here and and lay blame because everyone always wants to lay blame, and it's, it's yeah. sort of shit. Um, I think uh, just just to clarify. do it now and see if we can get away with it, and even then we weren't. But there were existing monuments in the ground that all the neighbors uh, verified as being the accurate property boundaries. And it's from a development that took place when in the, you know, seven, 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it, um, you know, a new survey, whether we did it then or it got done recently, would certainly uncover I think a lot of those issues similar to ours, but it was really just us acknowledging that we knew where the points were 
and uh, accepting what was commonly held to be, to be true in the neighborhood. And no, we did not do a survey, but it wasn't required. And we had no reason to doubt that those monuments in the ground were, were accurate. So here we are today, uh, 12 years later or whatever, uh, Thank you. stuck. Yeah. So. Jim, did you? Um, having been on the zoning board for six years, uh, question for you, Michael, this whole practical difficulty issue. Um, is there any reason why we have, we're not dealing with anything less than 10 feet? Is there any reason why we have decided not to deal with that? Because it would have gone to zoning, could it have not if it was? Because the pattern of development in Cape Elizabeth is people do not want homes closer than, they don't want zero setback property lines. Uh, 10 feet is really a minimum to, yeah. to get access to fire departments, to do all those other things that, you know, can create the whole visual impression of Cape Elizabeth. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think, Michael, your suggestion that when it's a close call, you demand a survey that makes, that's, makes all sense in the world. No reason to do it when it's pretty obvious one way or the other. Does someone want to make a motion? Yeah, I'd be happy to make Good. a motion. And I'm sympathetic to what happened here. I didn't mean to suggest you, you did no, anything no, no. On, on, on purpose um, uh, in, in any event. Uh, I move that the council authorize the manager to file an action in the main district court in connection with a modest side yard setback violation at 21 Woodcrest Road, created when an addition was constructed in 1999 to 2000, and the owners mistakenly assumed the location of their boundary with 17 Woodcrest Road, and to thereafter enter into a consent judgment under which the town would agree not to seek further enforcement of the setback violation conditioned upon A, the owner's paying to the town the cost of such action, at estimated at $1,000, and B, the code enforcement officer recommending such action after determining the views of all abutting property owners. I second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you in the neighborhood. Yeah. Item 41, <coughs> the bus trolley program for Fort Williams Park. Um, just to quickly cover the three points of this, uh, the original fees that we adopted will remain in place, <coughs> except any locally based tour operator who agrees in advance to participate in the invoicing program will pay 35 per bus instead of 40. The Portland Headlights Museum director may have some flexibility in waiving the bus fee for 2012 for any tour that evidence can be shown that the tour pricing was set before November 1st, i.e. they'd already set the fee when we agreed upon this. And that, the, that we agree to authorize hiring a greeter uh, at the Portland Headlights for 2012. 75% of the cost will be budgeted through the Portland Headlights. Uh, and that's really just to greet people when they get off the bus and tell them about the park a little bit and also about local businesses in Cape, which we thought would be a value added. Um, so moved. <laughs> Second? Second. Discussion? I'd just like to note that Greg Gordon is here from Intercruises, and he and others in the industry have been very helpful throughout the process. Did you want to say anything? No. <laughs> You've waited so long. You're so <laughs> Sorry. Discussion? Kathy? Um, can somebody explain the um, uh, issue about greeters and the expense of having greeters and, and what the purpose of that is? Mike? Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, Sarah began to ex explain a little bit. For, for a long time, we have people arrive at Portland Headlight, and they arrive at that circle. We have buses that don't stop in the right places. We have cars that just want to seem to stop in the middle of the roads. And we have a lot of people seeking tourism information. Where are the toilets? Uh, how do I get to the lobster shack? Uh, the rest of it. Uh, while we have ranges there at times, we don't have uh, and they're there particularly during the busiest time, during the cruise ship season, they're, they're not there all of the time. Uh, what we'd like to do is have greeters who, who were there uh, throughout the busy season, who not only welcome the, the buses and collect the fees, uh, which, which, is, which, is a, which is a big issue, uh, but also who uh, are sort of ambassadors of the community. Uh, they, they'd wear logo wear that uh, identifies them with the property. Uh, they would uh, point out the presence of the gift shop, uh, and they would also have materials with them. Uh, we hope to work with, as was discussed during the workshop, with the, the Cape Elizabeth Business Alliance uh, to give materials to 
visitors to say you might want to go to this farm stand, you might want to go to this restaurant, uh, just basically to help people. So we see this as a benefit to the park, a benefit to the visitor, uh, and a benefit to uh, the town, uh, enhanced safety, and uh, as well a, a benefit to the local businesses in Cape Elizabeth. Kathy. Being new, I probably don't understand this, but would the greeters be at all um, charged with um, telling um, the bus drivers to um, shut off buses in terms of idling? Absolutely. Thank you. We don't guarantee a 100% success rate, but that will be part of the responsibility. I understand, because um, I know I've personally been in the park um, one time there were seven buses and they were all idling and it was um, uh, very distressing in terms of trying to breathe um, so I just I mentioned that um, I'm not saying it's going to be perfect but even if half of the seven buses weren't idling that would be an improvement thank you I, I agree but you know we're really you know we think we can do it with kindness and and you know we're looking for a positive rather than a person with a badge and a uniform uh, looking at it as an enforcement. We're looking for a friendly approach on all these things. Thank you. We want to welcome visitors. Right. Other comments? All those in favor? Unanimous. Good question. Uh, item number 42, bond refinancing. I'm going to turn this over to our finance chair, Frank. Okay. Um, well, what's being proposed here is a refinance 2002 general obligation bonds, a million and a half dollars. And uh, what's being proposed is to refinance up to $780,000 of these bonds. Interest rates have declined sharply since they were originally issued, and it could save the town over $115,000 over the next 10 years. So uh, I move that we authorize the town manager to refinance up to 780000 of the prior bonds in order to take advantage of this drop in interest rates and affect the cost savings for the town as set forth in our packet. Any additional information Second. we need? Second. Comments? Jessica? Um, what's the time frame on this, and does this um, uh, extend our debt service? Uh, uh, through, the, through the chairman. Uh, it's the original <coughs> maturity date. Uh, it's not extended, and the time frame is, is all very, very short term. I did I attach the calendar? I think I did. Uh, did I attach the calendar? No. The, the time frame is I have a meeting with Joe Katara, the financial advisor, on Wednesday. Uh, the pricing of the bonds, the sale of the bonds. <coughs> I think it's all completed by April 16th. Ring a bell? You got the schedule? What's the final date, Frank? April 16th. April 16th. And you want to move quickly to take advantage of low interest rates. Yeah, and, and the, actually the rate gets set about three weeks before that. Right. So when does, when, but when is this uh, debt finished? Ten years. Ten year, was it ten years? The final maturity date is 4-1-22. Maturity of the original yep. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. Other questions or comments? All those in favor? Unanimous. <clears throat> Item 43, the Town Council Goals. We had two workshops on this um, <clears throat> and came out with our goals for the year that are posted online if anyone's interested in looking at them. We were happy to check off a few already in our, when we finally approved them. So uh, does anyone want to provide a motion? Jim? I move that we accept the Town Council goals for the year 2012. It's not included in our packet, but on, on the website. We've all seen it. Second? Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Item 44, the Thomas Memorial Library and Cultural Center. I see two people are here for that. Does either of you want to say anything? Okay. Uh, why don't we start with a motion? 
Jessica? I'd like to move, um, and I'm not sure how to do this procedurally, I'd like to move the item but amend it. Okay. What, um, what is the procedure? Do I get a motion then amend it or is she yeah, just I'm not, off I'm not exactly one? sure. Well, Te technically, there's no motion on the table. Right. So you can, okay. You can, these are just drafts. I can just make can... a motion with my amendment. Sure. And, okay. Yeah. All right. I'll do that. <laughs> I move uh, to accept item number 44-2012 uh, as amended to remove item 3. Item 3? Yes. And just to clarify, do you want to read item 3? Yes. For the yes, doors? Yes. The, the uh, item number 44 is Thomas Memorial Library and Cultural Center. Item number three, request the town council chairman, the finance committee chair, and the town manager to work with school officials and others to evaluate capital needs in light of the upcoming retirement of debt service payments for past school projects. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, Jessica, do you want to explain why you wanted to delete number three? Sure. I don't really, you know, as I've reviewed this, I don't really think that ultimately it's entirely germane. I think that that, while a worthy endeavor, probably belongs more with general budget than, to, than directly with our work on forwarding the, town, uh, the uh, Thomas Memorial Library. We don't do this with other um, as we progress with other capital projects or whatever we're looking at. And it just does not seem appropriate to me in this setting. I think it, there are, that it belongs in the general budget process. Any other comments? Frank? Yeah, I guess I feel strongly about retaining this because in the general <laughs> budget process, we don't look at debt capacity over a multi-year period. And, and um, or the potential for taking on additional debt over a long-term multi-year period. And I, I feel very strongly, that, and secondly is that one of the premises of financing this was that the potential existed that if this, as the school debt ran off, there would be created additional debt capacity. Um, so to the extent to which that was gonna be used to finance this, it's logical for me that you'd wanna assess the need for that additional debt <laughs> the schools, uh, I also personally believe that we need to look at this very holistically and look at capital requirements throughout the entire town before we determine that we want to allocate six, seven, eight, million, whatever the dollar amount is of our debt capacity to a single project. So I, I think it's an important step to properly evaluate the entire thing. Dave? I mean, I, I'm feeling a bit torn on this issue uh, because I, I certainly respect the view of Frank that we ought to be looking sort of holistically before we take a leap and, and embark on a project as uh, expensive as a library. On the other hand, every time the council is ready to move forward on a project, the, the naysayers, and I'm not saying that Frank is one of them, but will say, oh, gee, we got to look at everything before we can possibly consider building the short road pathway. Let's look at every single sidewalk in the entire town and every single expenditure before we embark on this. And, and to me, when people say that, one light bulb is going off in my head, well, that person just wants to derail the project because this task will take months and months, if, you, or if not years, and then we'll never get the library sort of up to a vote. I mean, I would actually, notwithstanding what I just said, though, I think it is important to just keep in mind what else is going on in the town in terms of, in terms of large capital needs. I just would not want item number three to cause a two-year delay in our deliberations. So as long as we can sort of move that process forward expeditiously, uh, I would be willing to support an amendment to reinsert that. I, I, I just don't want this to be an opportunity to delay. Let me let's just respond to that for a moment. I, I, I agree with you, David, and I think actually developing the process by which we're setting priorities would help facilitate all the projects going forward, as opposed to having to raise the question. So if we, we assessed really the general priorities in town, uh, we would have a sort of a 10-year timer, five-year timer, as whatever, where the town the council, the relevant council, would have done a good, thoughtful process of figuring out where our priorities are and avoid any undue delays. Can I, Jessica? Well, I, with respect, I would, I would remind the, the council as a whole that the library review and progression of, of uh, dealing with our library has been a stated 
and written council goal for a number of years now. And you know, we started with our study in 2007 and we don't, and although it's true, we're looking at the possibility of, of less debt service as a result of a retiring a $22 million bond for the middle school, and that certainly may help going forward. We don't do this, that I recall, in this manner with other projects, and that's why I object to it. Can I make a, sorry, Jim. That's a, go ahead. I was just gonna edit here to try to make everyone happy, but you go ahead oh. first. <laughs> you try to make it's it. my job. No, 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 no. <laughs> On, as a practical matter, okay, um, Frank, how, uh, Sarah, how long do you think that this type of review would take? I mean, it just seems to me no matter what we decide to do, knowing this I think is a very important exercise as we sort of think five years out or ten years out because, you know, we do have plant and equipment in all of these buildings we own and these trucks we drive and fire trucks and all that kind of thing. And it just seems to me that the exercise, I think, is a healthy one and one that I think if it can be done in a timely manner so as to not stall what's really, really happening here with this library. I think if the fear is that it may detract, uh, you know, sort of take us off the task at hand, I could agree. But I believe it's, a, it's, it's something we ought to do. I just wonder how long it would take. Well, and I'm hoping for one meeting. One meeting? Michael, do you think? Yeah, we have a meeting scheduled, if I might, is it this Friday? It is. We have a meeting scheduled this Friday with the superintendent uh, and plan to get right on it. Obviously, I would, I would hope that she would consult with mm -hmm. uh, the school board and their finance committee on this. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, I, I look at it as, you know, you tick off the different boxes on any different project. And this is one of the boxes that you need to tick off. Sure. You, and, and, you know, I would hate to find out two years from now, or 2014, when, when their debt's retired, that suddenly they're playing an $8 million bond and find out then. I'd rather find out now uh, so, that, so that everything we say and do between now and then is with a clear understanding of what the direction is. I'd hate to mislead anyone in the In, in, the, in short the workshop, term. some of the discussion we had was around what the citizens really feel and want to have happen here. And I think the answer with this information to the citizens would be a pretty solid, here's where we believe the allocation of capital dollars ought to be. Because we've looked at the schools, we've looked at the firehouse, we've looked at, I mean, I, I just think it's, a, it's, a, it's an exercise that frankly the fact we haven't done it in the past surprises me. Mm -hmm. But on a go forward basis, I think it would be absolutely helpful to us as we prioritize things going forward. I'd like to create, correct a misimpression we have done in the past. We, we waited, one of the reasons the town had a lot of debt between 2000 and 2002 is that we kept waiting for other debt of the schools to be retired when, when they, all those projects got delayed while they did the middle school and the elementary school renovation. So we've always worked in concert with the school department. This is, this is not new and I, I think the citizens you know, anticipate that we would look at all these things holistically. Uh, you know, I don't see where it, it delays the, the school, the library project at all. I think it informs the project in terms of uh, resolving more, of making more issues known. You know, the, the, the projects always get delayed in Cape Elizabeth when there's the unknown. They move forward when we have the known. That'll solve. Kathy, did you have? Yes. Um, I see this a little bit differently in terms of um, what the questions seem to be. Um, being a prior eight-year member of the school board, my concern is that the, um, this particular piece takes out of context what the school board normally would do, which would be to evaluate themselves their capital needs and then present it to the town council as a, a whole um, and um, ask for what their capital needs are. I don't see a need for um, part of the town council to meet with part of the school board to evaluate what their capital needs are. I, I see it as a whole. When, when the purpose of the meeting is, is not to have two school board members or two town councils decide the needs. It's, right. to, it's to go to have the dialogue, we need this information from you. You know, we, we never tell the school department, uh, you know, that we need to have something by next date. 
they are charged with the oper with the, the management of the school department, but yet, you know, we, we also, uh, you know, know that everything needs to be done collectively in this town with with reaching out, and you know, I, assu I assume they'll do that, and I assume it will take six months, but I assume it'll get, get kicked off this week. But my I question is, is why doesn't it just be become part of the school budget that is proposed to the town council? Can I answer that? I think it is, and they are doing what they usually do. Um, but I, I talked to the chairman of the school board, and she said that they have been looking at this, Greg Marls in particular, and um, welcome the opportunity to start talking about it. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's out of the norm or special. It's just a way to get the conversation going because by the time we hear from them and their budget, it'll be another almost two months. But can I make it just a suggestion in wording here that might make this more palatable? How about if we just say, we keep three in, but we just say request the town council chairman, the finance committee chair, and the town manager to evaluate capital needs in light of the upcoming retirement of debt service payments for past projects. In other words, shouldn't we be doing that a little bit, just figuring out the needs? Now, we'll meet with who we need to meet with. I had anticipated we would meet with just more than the school. So this, we, I don't want to set this up as a school versus municipal priority thing, right? We'll meet with whoever we need to meet to get a view of what all the capital needs in the town are, and then we'll make it known. It was specifically drafted with school officials and others. And others, right. But why not just say, we'll evaluate it? I don't know. Jessica, what do you think? Well, I still think, I mean, I think that, that the concept is fine. But I, I think it's inappropriate in this motion. I think that I agree with what Councillor Governale says. You're looking at all these things. But I, I don't um, see that a, you know, more, of, more or less an anecdotal discussion on this matter would then, you know, possibly weigh in on this amendment and cause any kind of delay or major decision making when it is only an anecdotal discussion is not the full, you know, the vote of the school board or their, their expressed, um, you know, voted upon um, decision on what their capital needs are going to be. It's, it's really a, a discussion, which I think is important, but I, you know, I just don't see it as appropriate with this amendment. Uh, with this motion, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, let's hear that and then let's figure out how to vote so we can keep moving. Yeah. yeah I understand Jessica's uh, concerns, but uh, it, it's not as if this is a necessarily a prerequisite to moving forward with a library project. We as a council can decide, uh, hey, we're ready to have a vote on this on X date, and if we have this evaluation and all this information, that helps us. If we don't, we can decide then we're going to move forward anyway, or not, but I, I don't see that it hurts to, to do this, actually. I think ultimately it's something that we ought to be doing. Right. Frank? To, to, to make progress here, do we need to make an amendment to reinsert three and take a vote on that, or just, or, or there more, more, is there more input? I think it's up or down, isn't it? Uh, do we have to vote on the first motion down and then re-propose a new motion? Or can we edit as we go? I don't know. The, 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 primary motion on the table is the one Councillor Sullivan made, and if anyone wanted to propose an amendment to that, the floor would be open. Okay, so why doesn't somebody propose an amendment? I guess I would propose that we take three and add it to that, to that proposal. Is there a second on that? I'd second that. Jessica? I don't understand what Governor, Governor you, Councillor Governelli said. Your proposal excluded three. Correct. It's proposing we I'm put proposing three an amendment to your proposal, which would insert three. Okay, I see. Okay. So why don't we vote on that? And whoever agrees with Jessica and wants to take it out, obviously, would vote no on Frank's motion. Okay. So was that seconded? Yeah, I, I seconded. You seconded. Okay. Yes. So all those in favor of passing this motion as set forth in our packet with all five points, all those in favor. I.e. Frank's well, well, motion. I'm voting on the Order. Amendment. You're really just voting on inserting three. That's correct. And not vote on the entire motion. Okay, sorry about that. All sorry. those in favor of reinserting three. Okay, sorry. Okay, so it passes five to two. So now we're back to the original motion. Do we Excuse need to? Me, you, can, you can ask. I'm sorry, three. opposed. All those opposed? Five to two. I just assumed you were opposed. 
So now, let's go back. Do we need to restate the original motion? I need it's to vote on the original through. motion as amended. It's as amended. Jessica? Um, and, and procedurally, I'm not sure how to do this, but I, I just had a little brainstorm. Okay. Is this, I would like to somehow put a time limit on this and would, or to suggest a, a uh, you know, we, that we revisit this within, I don't know, 60 days or something. Do we have is that, have that what, motion? Would we do or something can you like just that? Do a friendly well, a suggestion. Well, I, I think probably what I wanted to do was ask you and the town manager about this concept. First of all, if we could have just a brief discussion. In other words, what because I, I don't want if this is going to occur, I was wondering if there was a way to amend you know the the prevailing motion to ask for a, a time limit or a, that this discussion would take place within and we would have the results within. Can I, something like that, if you think it's workable, if you don't, you'll, you'll tell me. I mean, we can, let's hear from other people. My sense is that these two are not temporally related, that we're not going to hold anything up about the library moving forward or any of these other points while we're doing this. That was my sense, that we're just, it's just going to sort of go concurrently and they're somewhat related. I didn't see it as like we have to check the box on each of this before we allow anything else to go. That was, is that what other people said? Yes. So in other words, it's all going to be this brew that happens at once. So, so can't Jessica amend that number three to put a timeline on it if she wanted to? She could. I'm just wondering if people would think it's necessary. When, when is your meeting? I'm sorry. If I'm right. This Friday? Um, Dave? I, I, I appreciate the desire to make sure this whole project moves forward, but I, I, I echo your comment, Sarah. I, I, I don't think this is going to stall the library. It, or it, I'm hearing that it, it, it's not a prerequisite. So I'm not sure a time limit is necessary, and I just we don't know what the what sort of feedback we're going to get from the school board. I we just we may we may not be in a position position to do this in 30 days or 60 days. So I would just rather leave it open. I agree. Other comments? Uh, to make a quick, we'll provide regular updates to the council on the discussions. Okay. I'm anticipating it will go very quickly. Maybe overly optimistic. Well, I mean, <laughs> we don't. I mean, the school board is just in the process of reviewing their capital plans. Right. I, I don't want to set the expectation that's going to be done next week. I think. No, no, I don't yeah, think next yeah. week. But I, I know they're they've been they're working on it. Right. It's not like we're going to meet with them and say, "Can you start this, please?" Right. So. Okay, so we're currently voting on Frank's motion. Correct. That is the straightforward motion in our packet, and we have a second. Are we ready to vote, or is there more discussion? Would you just repeat this Voting motion? motion? Would you repeat main the main, main motion? Not mine. We're main. voting on the main motion. Okay. All five items. All, All five, five items. points. All five. All right. So what did I just? The main motion being. The one that's really one set forth in our packet. Do, do we need? We didn't already do that. No, we haven't voted on that yet. Oh, gotcha. So is everyone clear, or do we need to restate it? Everyone's clear. All yeah. those in favor? One, two. All those opposed? Five to two. Item number 45, drainage easement. Um, it's proposed to gratefully accept two drainage easements on Rocky Knoll Road from the Dinmore and Kerrigan properties. Uh, and many thanks to them both. The town attorney will file the deed upon receiving release of any mortgage holders. Mike, do you want to? I'd just like to note the presence of Robert Malley in the audience. I think he spent a good 20 hours on this over the last uh, four months. And, uh, express my appreciation to him, to the Dinsmores, to the Kerrigans, and to the town attorney, and to the other attorneys involved in this. Uh, it'll enable us to better uh, take care of the drainage in this area. Actually, I'd like to say that was 22 hours now. <laughs> uh, do we have a motion? Dave? I move that we accept the drainage easements as uh, set forth in our materials tonight. Jessica. I'll second. Any comments, questions? All those in favor? Unanimous. Item number 46. Um, this is about the Great Pond Boat Rack Program. It's recommended that we thank the Conservation Commission. Thank you very much. 
for the report on the Great Pound Boat Rack Program and approve its recommendations. Jessica, you for the liaison, do you want to say anything or make a motion? Uh, yes. I mean, overall, this continues to be a very successful program. So um, it's, it's working well and to the enjoyment of many. So. Yeah, and, and, and again, thanks to the Conservation Commission. I know how much work they do. So do you want to make a motion? <coughs> yes, thank, thank you. I move that we uh, thank the Conservation Commission for their report on the Great Pond Boat Rack Program and that we approve uh, their recommendations. Seconded. Discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Uh, item number 47, hardship abatement guidelines. Um, we formed a subcommittee to, to look at these and try to make them a little bit more, shape them somewhat to provide some guidance and some clarity. Dave, do you want to make the motion since you were part of the committee? Sure. I would uh, move the council that we approve these guidelines for hardship abatements. Second. Discussion? Can you tell me what the difference is between the uh, guidelines you had before and what the new guidelines are? I don't see any red marks or... Do you uh, want to take that? Well, I, I, I'll defer to the town manager, but I, He's not I'm not aware that we actually had guidelines no, before, so this was a... a sorry. sorry. <laughs> I, it's all red. But but never mind. <laughs> red. But Kathy, very good Kathy, you had me you really worried there for a second. <laughs> it was a trick question, David. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, but we sorry. implicitly yeah. had them, but we tried to... Kathy, one of the advantages of being a new... <laughs> okay, it's one. Great but, job. But, yeah. but, but the idea was that these are all issues that have come up in our meetings when we discuss hardship abatement. So we thought, and with Mike's and Deborah's assistance, put pen to paper so that it's there in front of us when we review the applications. And also there are draft motions in there, so that'll give us guidance as we work our way through the issues. And just of note, we tried to, they're not too rigid. I mean, a, a lot of it obviously is a judgment of the council, and we tried to keep that flavor in it, but just to have a little bit more of a roadmap and a containment. Yeah. A uh, question for Deb. Uh, beside you, you're the person who usually has to uh, sit with somebody. How does, how does this, how do you feel about this? I mean, you're the one who has to deal with the applicant, and it, it seems pretty straightforward, it, and I'm sure you've weighed in. I hope you have anyway. Um, what do you think? It's very helpful to have this information to share with an applicant of potential things that the council would be looking for, yeah. particularly if there's time that, that somebody can apply for some of the things that are suggested here, or we can set them up with a social worker or what have you. So it's very helpful to kind of know where the council may be coming from um, when the applicant does apply, rather than just kind of a blank yeah. slate going in. Okay, that's good. Other comments? Uh, implementation of this new s standard would be the next application, or is there one of the immediate? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. All those in favor? <laughs> Can I just ask one question? Yeah. Sorry. Sure. So the way this will work is that Deb, you'll do an initial review of this, and then based on that review, make a recommendation to the, the council as to whether to um, support or deny an abatement request. Is that how it's going? Generally, the the manager makes with applicants as well. I, I'm not sure that we'd actually make a recommendation. I think that we would uh, provide you with as much information as we can. I think that's always um, the tricky part going into these is, is to make sure we have as much information. Um, and that our decision can be informed by this. Indeed. Uh, okay. Just on that note, for these, we'd, we'd rather give advice not in writing and in executive session uh, for reasons of dis legal discovery. All those in favor? Unanimous. Uh, now is the time for citizens uh, who want to discuss anything, item that's not on the agenda. I don't see too many people left here, so we can move on. Um, so I need a motion for item number 48 to continue the uh, annual evaluation of the town manager. Um, we need a rather official motion to go into executive we session. Close this stuff first. Oh, do I have to close our regular meeting? Oh, oh. no, I No, I think we do that oh, and then adjourn. Okay. So I need a motion to go into executive session. 
I move that we go into executive session pursuant to the applicable statute, which I no longer have in front of me because I closed my. Uh, do you have it right Do there? you mean with Thank one you. MRSA 4056A? Yes. <laughs> to continue the annual evaluation of the town manager. Seconded. All those in favor? Unanimous. Uh, and then we need a motion to adjourn. No. Oh, we don't adjourn. Not yet. Sorry. No. Thank you. That's a good idea. <laughs> So we, um...